Welcome to Cash Plays. And now your host, Bart Hansen. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cash Plays. I am Bart Hansen. This is the May 13th episode of Cash Plays. Thinking ahead, but acting street by street. As always, you can email me at cashplays at pokerroad.com or shoot over a voicemail, 877-836-ROAD, 877-836-7623. I'm actually recording this episode on uh, Sunday, May 11th, as I am going to Calgary once again tomorrow morning to do voiceover work for the uh, Canadian Heads Up um, poker um, event that uh, Adam Schwartz and I did live, uh, what was about two months ago. Hopefully, we're going to have Adam on the show um, for next week's episode. We're going to get into a little bit of uh, Limit Hold'em and also some Limit Omaha High Low, as those are the two games that uh, Adam primarily plays. So if you want to uh, email some Limit Hold'em questions or Omaha 8 or Better Limit questions, go right ahead. Um, I'm actually doing this kind of late on Sunday night. I played, and I really never do this in uh, the F Tops uh, event number nine, three hundred twenty dollars buy-in tournament, just because um, I have to leave early tomorrow morning. Knew it wasn't going to go to the casino, and I thought it was a great value. I think it was a one point five million guarantee, and um, I cashed. I, I got three hundredth place or something, and I doubled my money. But I got to tell you, again, I don't think I've played an event since maybe one of the events in the W Coop. I don't know how these kids do it. I don't know how they play tournaments online full time. I mean, the beats I took, the beats I gave, the variance of online tournaments is just absolutely insane. Talk about having to have some emotional stability. I'm glad I play cash games for a living. Um, just the fact that, you know, tournaments don't give you any type of flexibility in scheduling. You know, I like to work out. I like to have a social life. And, wouldn't really want to always be tied down to you know the the nightly 109 on poker stars or or the sunday million which supposedly is a pretty good value but anyways i gave it a shot played well and you know what can i do uh, i would have liked to have won the $230,000 first prize but it wasn't meant to be uh, i want to plug again my other show um radio show on world series of poker.com which i do with uh, my buddy nick geber you can go over Head over there and check it out. Click on radio, and all the shows are uh, are archived. But again, get those emails in there for Adam Schwartz. He is the host of the Two Plus Two uh, Poker Podcast, and we'll talk a little limit poker uh, next week. Before I want to get into uh, thinking ahead and playing street by street, just want to uh, you know touch upon what I've been discussing the last few weeks and the the super polarization of hand ranges when it comes to live players. And I'll give you a couple examples. And I actually did something for the very, very first time. And I was thinking back, and I've never done this before. I actually folded Pocket Kings preflop um, in a cash game, just basically just a dump. And um, had the opportunity to play in a, in a Hollywood private game. And I have a buddy that's been playing in some of these games, so... Hopefully I'll play in some of these games more and more. It'll be a little more convenient for me, and hopefully the games will be a little bit better than the live games. But um, we were playing six-handed, and it was later on in the night around 1 or 2 a.m., and the guy that ran the game actually sat down because we were short-handed, and we were playing 10-25. And um, you know, he opened for 75 on the button. The small blind called him, and the big blind with two black kings, and I make it 400 out of the big blind. And he immediately ships it all in for 3500 and I have him covered in the small blind fold. And I know this guy, you know, he, he is a celebrity, I'm not going to name him, and he used to kind of be donkish, now he's definitely much, much better, and he plays super nitty preflop. And, you know, the point of the story is, you just got to weigh, you know, all the elements of, of what goes into a hand. And a lot of times, you don't have a whole lot of information if you're playing against somebody at a casino, but in this case, I knew that the guy ran the game and that he didn't want to break the game and they didn't want to come and bust basically what is one of his customers, you know, the, uh, one of the first few hands that he played. Um, and again, super, super nitty preflop. And I could really only put him on two hands, aces or kings. And I don't even know if he would do that with kings. So he shoved for 3,500. You know, I thought about it for a little bit and I just dumped it. And he actually ended up showing me two kings. And again, you know, if those two hands are in his range, 
it's obviously um, the right lay down. The funniest thing is, last night at the Commerce, I've actually been playing at the Commerce this week. I've, I've, I've been playing 1020. The games are definitely better over there and have built my confidence kind of, you know, I kind of went back down to the 510 game at the bike, which is a game, you know, I knew that I could beat. Now I'm going back up to the normal game, um, built a little more confidence back up and uh, playing with great confidence. And I, and, I, and I just have played three, you know, nine hour sessions over the last few days with players there. And even though the game is nitty, it's just full of tight, bad players, which you'll find a lot, um, you know, as you move up in live, no limit, just because a guy is tight doesn't mean he's good. And it just happens to be that you might not get in a hand with him for a few weeks to figure out, you know, how bad this guy really is. You know, obviously some of the telltale signs are, are, you know, the ability for these guys to stack off with over pairs, but missing value bets and stuff too. I mean, if you ever want to look at a game where you're playing, with the same players, and you think, oh, well, this isn't really a good game, give it a chance and, and really, really pay attention because you will find that people are making mistakes all over the place. And it's those types of missed value bets and just, you know, really bad post-flop play that really will give you tells as to who you really want to be going after in these cash games. And just want to talk about the variance in, you know, when you're buying in for what I call a super buy-in, which is something that that I addressed a couple episodes ago. When you're playing extremely deep and you get it in really, really good and you lose, you know, that type of swing can hurt. And when you're talking about bankroll management and people say, well, you know, you should have 20 to 30 live buy-ins, um, well, you know, which we've gone over, which is about proper... But I've talked about super buy-ins, and a super buy-in is something that I usually consider about probably 250 big blinds or more. I call that a super buy-in. And when you're buying in that deep, you really don't need to have 20 or 30 buy-ins, I really, I don't think. Because if you, if you have the ability or if you're at the comfort level of buying in that deep, you're really never getting your money in there unless it's a real super cooler situation or you get sucked out on. And, and, you know, you have to remind yourself, the money is definitely always in play. But I like to buy in deep because I think I have an advantage over other people, um, you know, that, you know, might have gone up from a short stack and buying in deep. And you take a look around at the table and you try to figure out, you know, how deep you want to buy. But uh, I'll give you, you know, this is kind of a bad beat story that didn't involve me, but it involved King King again preflop. Where this girl who comes in from Vegas, who, who's really nitty, kind of a kind of a tightish bad player, limped in under the gun. We're playing seven handed last night at the Commerce. I got James Woods to my left. I open for eighty with two black kings again. James Woods calls, real solid tag on the button calls eighty. Gets back around to this girl, and she limp re raises to four hundred and twenty. I've got forty five hundred in my stack. The button has 8,700, and she covers. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, can this possibly be happening to me again, just like it happened in the private game? How is this possible? But I thought that, you know, again, kind of the situation where I had the, the queens before last week or a couple weeks ago, I thought I could call. You know, if she has aces and I flop a king, I'm going to stack her. I'm not probably quite deep enough for set value, but it's just too tight just to fold. I think I can call in position and see what happens. To my dismay, the button also calls. And again, he's very, very deep. So the pot is something like $1,500. And the board comes out jack-8-7 with a couple diamonds. She comes out and leads for 1500 out on the flop. You know, I take a second and I fold my kings because I know they're, they're no good. The tight, solid guy on the button shoves all in. He shoves all in, and I'm like, wow, well, this guy's got to have a set of jacks here or a set or maybe 9-10, but I thought the raise was too much to call with 9-10. Back over to her, you know, 6500 for her to call. She snap calls. We're looking at an eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 pot. Jack, 8-7, two diamonds, one club. He shows me his hand. He's got 9-10 of clubs. He flopped the nuts. Turns an ace of diamonds. Rivers is seven. She tables aces full. $19,000 swing for that guy. Mega super buy-in down the drain. Again, when you're playing deep, the money's always in play. They don't allow you to run it more than once at Commerce. But um, sometimes, you know, you know, that's a situation where it might only come up once every couple months if you're playing, 
you know, full time. You really can't ask for anything else, but it's going to happen. Um, you know, the, it's in, it's interesting that call that he made pre flop with the nine ten, and we discussed this a little bit last episode about how sometimes that five times ten times, or excuse me, ten times twenty times rule or five percent ten percent rule, is wrong when we're talking about suited connectors and pocket pairs. And I do question his call pre flop, even though he was getting about three to one from the pot. He has got to know that one of us has aces or kings, which is fine. And I like a call with a pocket pair more because with a set, if you flop a set, you can just get it in. But the problem with a hand like nine ten suited in that spot, even though he's getting, even though he's only calling about five percent of his stack off, or twenty times, he's going to make twenty times the raise size. Is that he knows that the money is going to go in, and you just do not flop one pair plus there that often, or, or excuse me, two pair, a minimum of two pair plus. You're going to be flopping a draw. So, you know, does he want to gamble for his stack if the board comes out 9-5 deuce with two clubs and he's got top pair and a club draw? And, sh- and he knows that she's going to stack off with aces and it's 50-50. You know, what does he do? So I, I think that the, the pre-flop call is a little bit speculative because um, it can really put you in a spot where you're going to have to gamble it out for a super buy-in. Um, you know, a lot of times you wouldn't think or you would think that fold equity would come in there, that somebody wouldn't stack off w- with aces. But against a certain type of tight bad player that has aces and has limp re-raised, you know, 450 preflop, they're not going to go anywhere. Um, it is interesting, though, that that game is nitty because I've been playing a lot of my draws really aggressive. And a lot of these guys that are nitty will not stack off with top pair. So I, I like to put pressure you know, on my hands with my nut flush draws, with my two-way draws, because there is fold equity. But against certain types of players, like we've discussed a ton on this show, there is no fold equity. So you've got to figure out what the guy is representing, who's made the raise pre-flop. Is he the type of player that's going to stack off? Do you want him to stack off? Do you want to be able to play your draws aggressively, deep, for fold equity? All of those things have to go into your into your head. Um, and again, you know, kings for me twice in a week like that, it's just... You know, I was right both times, but uh, something I haven't come across in a long time. Um, the title of this show is Thinking Ahead, um, but Acting Street by Street. And the reason why I want to talk about this is this is a hand that, that happened to me yesterday. And I have a, a good friend of mine that, that I've been playing with a lot, and I really respect his game. He's really talented. And he watched me play this hand where a couple people had limped, and I raised in the cutoff with Queen Jack suited. And I was heads up with uh, with one guy. Um, and, and the stack sizes really don't matter. I think we were 4,000 deep. And the board came out king, king, six, rainbow. And the pot was about, I think it was about $240. There was actually three people in the hand. And um, guy in the blind checked. And this guy in the middle let out. He let out for like 120 and I really thought that he was just donking out with a six or with a pocket pair or something. I just didn't believe that he would lead with a king. Um, I really didn't respect his game. I hadn't seen him before, but I'd only been playing for about 20 or 30 minutes. I just thought that there was a very good chance that he would check the turn to me. And if I bet, he would fold. Obviously, there's a third guy in the hand. So I call, and luckily for me, that guy folds. When, you, when you're floating... I'd rather float heads up, but I was going to take that chance three-handed that the guy in the blind was going to fold, and he did. So the guy that's 120 and I call. I have no draw, no backdoor draw, absolutely nothing. King, king, six. Uh, pot now is about $500. Turn is a, is a I think the turn is a, is a nine, which got me thinking a little bit because I thought some of his range might be something like pocket nines or something like that. Um... He checked, he checked me, and I took my standard line, which was like, I'm going to represent like I was slow playing a king, and I bet 350. And he thought about it for a second and then called. And, and I thought to myself, wow, well, does this guy really have a weak king? Or is he just getting stubborn with a hand like pocket sevens or a six? I, I just didn't think he had pocket nines at the way that he called, and I thought maybe he'd make some sort of move. So when he called the 350, you know, the pot is like about $1,200 now, and I was just like, oh, damn, I'm just going to have to check now. I'm just going to have to give up at the end here. 
you know, the guy, he's, he's going to turn over some stupid hand like 8-6. He's going to look like a, you know, you know, like a genius. But I said to myself right there, I'm giving up. I said, damn, it's over. River comes a jack. King, king, nine, deuce, jack. He checks for me. And without even thinking, I check behind. And he says, two pair. I said, which ones? And I turn over Queen Jack. And he, and he was really, really, really upset. But the point of this story is, is that I missed a $500 value bet on the river. I really wasn't even thinking through my head on the turn. I had just totally blocked out the river play. Um, you know, I was, really wasn't playing the entire hand. And I totally shut my mind off on the river and I was not playing street by street at the end. I just had given up and the guy got tilted. But the thing is, is that if I throw in a modest bet there at the end, and this is probably not a spot to over bet because remember I am representing a King. So a lot of times if you throw a big bet in there at the end, it's like I have a King. Kings are definitely in my range there. But if I throw in a modest, what looks like an under bluff there and his read was that I had nothing, which was correct on the turn. Remember, he check called the turn with 8-6 suited. Then I throw in a bet there, and he calls, and he gets tilted even more. Gets, he, he, he goes nuts, the fact that I value bet there, you know, a jack. And in retrospect, when I'm looking over the hand, it seems like such, a, such an obvious value bet. But I think that definitely one of my personal leaks that I want to share with all of you guys, and maybe you can see it in your own game, is that throughout a hand certain actions happen where you might think, oh, I'm just going to give up. Or you might make a decision at what to do on the next few streets because of what has happened on earlier streets without actually looking at the whole picture and looking at you know what might come out as a card on the turn or on the river. Sometimes you're bluffing and sometimes it might turn into the best hand. You know, something like that. You know, a, a lot of times guys will bluff with overcards. Um, you know, an easier example would be, you know, if the board came out low and you made a continuation bet with two high cards and the guy called, and you know, and the turn came a queen, which you thought you could represent and say you had ace-king and you bet again and he called again. And then the river came a king or an ace and you already had said in your mind, well, I'm just going to give up on the turn. If I hit my card, so be it. Pot's too big. I'm just going to check behind. But when you actually start thinking about what this guy might be calling with, and especially if you think that this is a station that thinks that you're weak and you're running some sort of bluff and you run into a marginal best hand, value bet that river. And think ahead, but play street by street. Um, and, and sometimes you can run into to situations where you, know, you might want to play tricky and check raise a river because of a card that comes out. Um, again, you know, betting a river for value in position when you thought you had no chance to win the hand. Um, I lost 400 or $500 worth of value right there. So just, again, think about every single action in the hand, concentrate on the entire hand. Um, and that's really my point for that lesson. And, uh, you know, if you if you add up your mistakes in a session, that was one of the other things too. You know, I had a really good week at Commerce, but I probably made a thousand or two thousand dollars worth of mistakes, whether it was bad calls, missed value bets, missed opportunities to bluff. You know, those types of things add up. So, you know, maybe a good idea might be to to go back after a session and actually write down some of the mistakes that you made, something that I've started to do. Or maybe write down some monetary mistakes that you think you made. You know, if you think you're running bad or you think that your expectation should be higher, if you can actually go back and you keep good records and you're keeping, you know, how much you won and how many hours you played, how about keeping some notes and actually writing how much you think you should have won and then tallying that up at the end of the month and factoring that into what your hourly would be for optimal play. And that kind of gives you, you know, it gives you a goal. It gives you something to strive for. Um, Because I know I left probably $3,000 on the table this week. Um, One of the other things that I have really, really been good about the last couple weeks, and it's improved my game immensely, is eating well and working out. I've started a new lifting cycle, 
And uh, I got to tell you, physical fitness, it has helped my game so much. You know, we talked a little bit about it with Brian Townsend. Absolutely paramount for me that if I can get into the right mental state, I'm going to be playing better. And for me, forcing myself to wake up, going and lifting, really gets me into the right mental state. And, you know, one of the good things that, that I've always done in the casino is I, I usually eat very, very well in the casino. And, you know, a lot of you guys out there that are skinny and never had any, you know, issues with, with weight or anything like that, you know, more power to you. But I really think that if you eat a lighter meal, it does not bog down your concentration level as much as, say, if you eat like a cheeseburger and french fries. Um, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I, I never ate salad before, ever, ever. And now what I'm doing, I go to the casino and I get like a piece of poached salmon with beets into a house salad, lettuce, onions, cucumbers. I don't like raw tomatoes. And put a little balsamic vinaigrette. Very lean protein, lots of vegetables, lots of water. Just kind of makes me feel better about myself, and it really makes me play better. So, you know, maybe one of these experiments, an experiment you might want to try to do when you're playing, um, say for the next maybe three or five sessions, is actually just cut out a lot of grease and see how see if that actually makes that much of a difference. You know, with games getting tougher out there, you should always be striving. You know, to improve yourself, obviously talent-wise, emotional control, but physically, test it out and see if it's you know it's something that uh, that helps your game out because it's definitely helped me out. We've got a lot of uh, emails, a lot of good emails, some interesting topics right around the corner. So we will be back right after this on Cash Plays. Cash Plays. Previously on Poker Road Radio. Bro, to make a hundred grand or a hundred fifty grand, travel around, leave your family, and play yeah. all these fucking events, and it's not even that, bro. This is a fuck. I don't give a fuck what anyone says. This is a fucking job. They tell you when the fuck to come, when to leave, when to eat, <laughs> when to piss. You can't go here. You can't look at your phone. You can't do fucking shit. You're coming to play from this time. I feel like I'm. It's like back to school again, all over again, bro, right? I mean, that's what it fucking is, dude. Don't miss a moment. Tune in to Poker Road Radio and get all the action from the tournament circuit. Cash Plays. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be taking some emails here. Uh, first one comes from uh, Adam Perkins, and this is a great question that I wanted to address. He says, hey, Bart, I was wondering if you might talk about the single table satellites that the World Series of Poker runs, and whether they may actually be a better value for a small-time player than the no-limit cash games or just buying into the $1,500 events. Can you make money winning multiple seats? I much prefer playing sit-and-goes online compared to multi-table tournaments, and I thought these f might fit into the side action you are trying to cover on your show. Excellent question, Adam. And I've got to tell you, if none of you guys, if, or if some of you guys have never been uh, to the Rio and are planning to go this year. The best value in the house. It's not the multi-table tournaments. It's not the cash games. It's the one-table satellites. And I will tell you why. For whatever reason, <clears throat> and I'm not complaining, Harrah's does not really vig the one-table tournaments. And I'll give you an example. I didn't play in any cash games really at all last year during the World Series of Poker. I played exclusively 525 one table uh, satellites and I think a thousand, I want to say a thousand forty or something like that. Now, I don't know that these numbers are, you know, exact, but from what I remember, I'll give you an example about the 525. So $525 dollars per player, 10 players. They take in $5,250. They pay out $5,100. And in satellites where it's $525 and up, they give you a $10 food voucher, which is good at any restaurant or at that World Series of Poker Cafe. So they are taking about $12 per person, $125 off the top, you know, twelve fifty per person, and then giving you ten dollars back 
for a food voucher. Now, the VIG percentage is a little bit higher as you move down. I think they have 100, 120, 240, and 360, but it's still a great deal. And it's winner take all, but they give you what's called satellite lammers, tournament lammers, which are tournament buy-in chips. So again, the 525, they'll give you 10 $500 buy-in chips, and then they'll give you $100 in cash. And you can go and buy into you know, any tournament with those chips, but you also can just get in line and sell them for face value for cash for people that are buying in. No one really gives you a hassle about it. It's like a courtesy. I buy it from people because I know that I do it. Um, spectacular deal. And the level of play in these one table tournaments, absolutely atrocious. Some of the worst play you have ever seen. I mean, I played in some five, 10, 10 and a quarter cash games that were good, but I actually thought that there were more value there was more value in the one tables. Now, I would do a couple hundred here and there and last longers with people. And you really got to know how to make deals at the end because, because it's a winner take all. Um, and because only one player you know, gets the right to have all of the money, the blinds are so high at the end that you almost always get down to three and you chop it. So you really have to be smart about it and, and think about it going in. Well, if we get 10000 dollars in total chips and I've got four thousand and the other two people have three thousand. Why would I want to chop why would I want to accept their deal to chop it evenly? If you're gonna chop it by chip count, or if you're gonna do something and they're gonna, you know, chop it by a percentage, but you have slightly more, then then tell them to throw in an extra hundred bucks. Always take your edge when it comes to chip count at the end when you're trying to deal there in a one table where, where the winner takes all. Remember, it's not, you know, they're not paying one, two, and three off. They're just paying one off. So it's not, the, the short chip stack doesn't have the advantage like in a multi-table tournament where the short chip stack is guaranteed whatever place money. If there's four people left and the short chip stack, you know, in, in fourth place, pays, say, $80,000, and you know they want to give the fourth-place guy in chips right now 90000 Well, of course he wouldn't do it because he doesn't have anything to lose. He's guaranteed 80000 But in these one-table tournaments, there's only one winner. So as the big stack, you know, don't ever take the worst of it. And when you are a small stack, always offer the worst of it to the big stack. So if you are in a situation where you've got 3000 another guy has 3000 and another guy has 4000 Say, do you want to chop it evenly? And then if I'm the guy with 4,000, I'm going to look at you like you're absolutely out of your mind and I'm going to decline it. But you will find that a lot of people are clueless and they'll have no idea. So do a little bit of research on deal making. Um, if you're going to play in these types of events, always try to take the best of it. And I think if your bankroll allows it, you know, you might want to do some last longers. And, and again, the play is just absolutely awful. I mean, people committing their chips in their first two levels. I don't understand some of these people who think that they need to raise three times the big blind in the first level with, you know, six, eight suited in the cutoff when the, the blinds are 25, 25, and you've started, you know, out with a bunch of chips. Um, but, you know, one of the other reasons to play in one of those one tables is that I think there's a lot, you know, a mentality issue that when you're playing in a lot of tournaments, like I'm going to be over the summer and like I did last year, sometimes you can kind of screw with your cash games. But if you're playing in a lot of sit and goes, it's a similar, you know, similar theory. It helps your tournament end game. Um, so I would seriously recommend looking into it. You know, if you don't believe me, go and play one. Just, just a great value, very, very small, vague the ability to sell your tournament lammers at face value almost all the time. Um, so, again, thank you for the email, Adam. Um, one of the things I've actually heard that the World Series Booker is going to do this year is they're going to have a separate room for the satellites, whereas um, in the previous three years of the Rio, it was all done in the Amazon room. I'm not sure if that's really going to affect anything, but uh, you, know, you can take a look for that. Um, next email comes from Matt from Long Island. He says, Hey, Bart. I know that you usually endorse fast playing most of your hands, but when is it ever proper to check raise the turn? Do you ever do it with your draws? Well, thanks a lot, Matt. And, you know, it's interesting because check raising the turn, I think for the first two and a half years that I played No Limit was really not in my arsenal at all. Um, I thought that the players were bad enough where, you know, if you're always betting for value, you're going to get called, you know, if, if the guy has something. 
And that still is for the most part true. But when you're dealing with a medium to a larger stock, and this is a situation that went down, um, I was actually, I've actually been going to Hustler one day a week after I do my World Series of Poker radio show, which is down by the airport. So I go to Hustler and Gardena. And at Hustler, they have a five, ten, twenty five hundred dollar cap game. And while I was waiting for that game, I was playing in a five, five game where I had built my stack up to a thousand dollars. And this particular hand went down. I raised it up with Ace King, and a guy called me. And the board came out Ace, Ace, Six. And the guy, he wasn't, I mean, he's a 5-5 five, five player. You know, pretty bad. He wasn't terrible. So I made a continuation bet. I think the pot had maybe $80 and it was three-way action. I think I bet 50 He called. There's no draws on board. I know right away he has an ace. Now here's a spot where before I would just continue to bet. I would bet, you know, maybe 150 on the turn. He would call and then maybe three or 400 on the river, and he would call. And I would get most of his money, but I think I might leave some money on the table with those types of medium stack sizes. Now what I've introduced in my arsenal is, if you absolutely know that your opponent has a good hand, and he has no regard for pot control. Now obviously with an ace-ace-six board, this isn't an example of pot control, but I thought the guy had a weak ace. I checked it over to him on the turn. He bet 80. I made it 200, and he just couldn't get away from it. I think he actually might have re-pushed. But even if he had called, I could basically move him in on the river. Check-raising the turn with a hand that you know is good against the guy that you know is going to bet the turn with a hand he thinks he's betting for value or a hand that's good, I think it's a good way to build up a pot. My concern sometimes with check-raising the turn is blowing a decent player off of a hand that he would have called your turn bet with. Um you know, if you're up against a very, very good player and he's smooth, he's flatted you preflop with ace four suited, and the board comes out ace ace six, you bet, and he calls. Now you check raise the turn. Very good player is going to fold that hand. But then again, if you're firing three barrels into to him, I would say a very good player might not pay you off on the river either. Um, but it is just definitely an example to check raise the turn. Um, Again, to get some more money in the pot against the guy that you know probably isn't going to lay down his hand. Here's another example that I just thought of. Let's say you raise it up with pocket jacks, and the board comes out ace, jack, three, rainbow. And you bet, and a tight guy calls. And you absolutely know that he has an ace, and you've got a set of jacks. A lot of these tight, bad players, they have no concept of way ahead, way behind, which is what we talked about they will auto, which we talked about last week, they will auto bet the turn with the ace. Turns a five. You check it over to them. Now they make a pot size bet. Now you make a check raise. And now they're, they, they, they get a little bit confused. And a lot of times they're not going to come off their hand. Sometimes they'll even come over the top of you. They make a call. You actually make more money in the long run there by check raising the turn with what you know is a good hand. Now, I wouldn't do this on dry boards, and I don't like doing it against decent players that understand pot control. Against a decent player, I think that probably betting your hand out is the best play, but you've got to change your lines up. Um, again, because I don't want to blow a decent player out of the pot, because a check raise on the turn is such a strong move that good players know what you're doing. Now, when you talk about check raising the turn with draws... I might pick a decent player to check raise my turn with draw. Let's take that same hand again where it comes, um, you know, ace, jack, deuce, two clubs. You've raised it up with king, queen, and clubs. You bet he calls. You're rather sure that he has an ace. Turns a six. You check it over to him. He now makes a bet that's indicative that he's trying to protect against a flush draw. And now you check raise with king, queen, and clubs. Uh, flush draw, gut shot there with the intention, with super fold equity of getting him off of a hand like an ace-queen. Um, something like that. I wouldn't do that against donkey players, though, that are going to call you anyways. Um, so, so balance your range out there. But again, with a medium to a larger stack, a deeper stack, and this applies for cap games as well, um, I think check-raising the turn with what you know is the best hand against a player that you know is going to bet the turn is a good way to get some money in there get more money in uh, and win you more money by the end of the hand. It allows you to make a bigger river bet. And, and again, this was not in my arsenal at all. It's probably only come into my arsenal the last, say, 
really only five to seven months. And, and if you can switch it up and change it up, I, I think it will add to your game. Those of you at the smaller levels, again, you know, use this, in, you know, use this kind of this information kind of sparingly because I, I never really want to miss value. But if you're playing at a low level game where, you know, the board comes out ace, ace, eight, and a guy's going to call you all three streets with an eight, don't, don't try to screw around with the check raise. But but pick your spots. Um, I think that that situation where you raise it up with a hand like tens, jacks, or queens, or kings, and you flop a set with an overcard up there, I think that's a great spot where you might be able to check raise the turn if you know that the guy will bet in what is top pair. You know, pocket tens, board comes out, queen, ten, deuce. Bet the flop, he calls you, you know he's got king, queen, or ace, queen, you check the turn, he bets the turn, now you make a raise, you confuse him, you get more money in the pot. Thank you for that email, Matt. Next email comes from Nathan Young from uh, Victoria, British Columbia. He says, hey Bart, I have a few questions about some things regarding travel and playing in live games. Now, for some background information on me, right now I live in Canada on Vancouver Island. The only place to really play is in Vancouver. A boat and hotel room cost factored in. It's not positive EV to play in those games that they offer there. Now, I've thought of moving to Vancouver, but the same problems are there and that the games just don't get big enough to really make money against the rake. I just wanted to know at what point should I give up living in my hometown and make that move to Las Vegas or Los Angeles or someplace else? Well, thank you for that uh, that e- that email, Nathan. You know, it's interesting. Obviously, I play full time in Los Angeles, and I've been out to Foxwoods. There's a lot of people that come to Commerce and stay in the hotel that live in Vegas during the off periods of the tournament because there really aren't that many games in Vegas above the five ten level. In fact, I think that there's only one daily game that goes at the Bellagio that's supposedly really not good um, outside of tournament time. Now, now the problem is, you know, if you're coming into poker, it's really such a tough time if you say, well, I want to make my living as a professional poker player, and I want to build a bankroll up. Now, we've discussed a lot about the beatability of of the rake at lower level no-limit games, and if you can beat a 1-2 or a 2-3 no-limit game, more power to you, but again, my contention is, is that I don't know if you can actually save enough money after your living expenses for a bankroll. Now, when you get up to a level of 5-5, five, five, when you can beat a game for 50 60 bucks an hour, and you're living kind of sparingly, you're a single guy, and you might be able to save some money up, then maybe now you can start building a bankroll up. I mean, in Los Angeles, there are a ton of games. If you really want to play a bunch of poker and want to play full-time, that's probably where I would recommend moving to. Now, I know that in Las Vegas, they have games, and the games are softer at the lower levels because of the tourists, but I'm not sure how many games they have from the 5-5 five, five and up level. And they've got 5-10 at the Bellagio, which is a 1,000 cap. Sometimes they do a 5-10 on cap game at the win. And you might be able to, you know, maybe that might be the best place to go and play, say, a 500 cap game. But I got to tell you, I mean, the games out here in L.A. at a 500 cap level are always good as well. And there's just so much more to choose from in terms of 5-10 and 1020. Now, I've been out to Borgata and Foxwoods, and the biggest no limit games they have there are 510, and there's really no game selection issues. So, if you're really serious about moving for cash game poker, I would recommend to all of you Los Angeles. Again, I hesitate to recommend playing cash game poker for a living to anyone now, unless you've got some money saved up or you want to use it as a bankroll, because it's just so hard really to come up through the rankings uh, in cash game poker now. Not that the games are extremely tough, but you can't really make soft money online. Whereas before, you know, you could play, you know, a bunch of one, two, no limit or two, four, no limit, beat the game and have a whole bunch of money. Well, if you're doing that now, you're probably making more money at those levels now than you're going to be making live. And you're a very good player because the games are very tough online. So, you know, you've got to just ask yourself, is this something that I want to do Two or three years ago, obviously, you know, if you had any type of ability, you know, you could, you know, people were printing money. But nowadays, I really would not recommend it to anyone playing full time, you know, to to try to, you know, build up through the ranks and play full time. You might want to supplement your income with poker. But if you really want to do that, I would recommend Los Angeles as a place to come. 
beautiful women, beautiful weather. What more can I say? If any of you guys have ever been out to the Hustler, my goodness, those card scanner girls, those two Cambodian girls, I think I'm in love. And uh, there's a cute brunette cocktail waitress there too. It's weird because the place just kind of attracts to me the hustler like i just want to keep going back there and seeing those girls unfortunately the 5 10 2500 game doesn't go all the time but for any of you that are listening to this in la when it has gone it is by far the softest 5 10 game in town softer than the bike softer than hollywood park it, it, it's amazing i mean these guys are like two three years behind but again the game doesn't go that much but uh you know i'll go over there once a, once a week and say hi. Thank you again for that email, uh, Nathan Young. Um, <clears throat> last email of the week comes here from Steve from Indiana. He says, I normally play two five no limit with a 500 or or $1,000 cap. Um, or I'll play one two no limit with a $300 buy-in to $500 cap. Here's my question. What is the best table image to try to project during the first portion of a playing session, assuming that these players won't know me at all or remember me from a prior session. I travel a lot. I've concluded that it might be a good idea to start out very aggressive and then tighten up. Other times this seems wrong and tight from the start seems best. Which is best? I also usually wear a coat and tie to try to look like a tourist who's just stopping in for a couple of hours between conference events. That seems to help uh, them underestimate the quality of my game. Interesting question, Steve. And I'm kind of a guilty of really not paying attention to this question. Uh, my buddy Dave Tuckman that used to do live the bike with me, he would always like, you know, have a great table image. Um, at first, you know, he would turn his hat sideways, talk a bunch of shit, act like a punk, even though he's like 37 or something. <laughs> I know he's listening to this. I think he, he kind of looked like he was 27. So he just acted like kind of a punk guy and, you know, he'd talk it up, show bluffs and it would really add to the game. Um, my own personal style is I actually like to start tight and then it kind of gives me a little bit credit to bully the table around later on. I just, that's just kind of the way that I do it. It's the way that I'm comfortable doing it. Whereas other guys will tell you that they will play loose or show a bluff and then that will give them, you know, kind of a negative image on the table where they'll get paid off later on. So I think that you can kind of experiment with it. Again, I really wouldn't go overboard. You're playing two five no limit with a five hundred dollar buy in with a thousand cap. Still good solid play is gonna win you money um in the long run. But if you're hopping around from casino to casino, you know, you, know, you might try to show a bluff or or show a bad call. Maybe it'll get you paid off later on down the line. I don't think that you should be wasting that much time thinking about it. Um Steve, I guess more power to you if you're wearing a uh, a coat and a tie. But uh, <laughs> yes, normally if someone's playing in my game that's wearing a coat and a tie, I think that they're a businessman and they don't know what they're doing. So that would work on me, you know, at first. But eventually, you're gonna have to show down some hands, and that's really what I'm looking at as a as a as a full time player. You know, not necessarily your attire, because um, you know I've seen guys in the past that definitely do not play consistent with the way that, you know, like a Mike Carroll would say that they would play, um, you know, in his book of tells. So I just don't think it means all that much, but you know, you might want to experiment with it if you're that concerned. Um, again, interesting email, Steve. Thank you very much. Well, that's going to wrap things up for this week. Um, tune in next week. I will be in Calgary once again, and hopefully we will have Adam Schwartz on the show talking about a little bit of uh, Limit Hold'em, which we haven't really gotten into on this show, and uh, Limit Omaha High-Low. I'm a little unfortunate because tomorrow, again, I was recording the show on Sunday, they have a PLO 8 or better F-Tops tournament, um, but by the time you guys listen to this, it'll be over, but good luck to any of you that are playing in that, and I will see you next week.